my students, others are invited from other teachers, some are staff members and teachers here. Uh, we have a very special guest, Ms. Braun. Uh, Ms. Braun is a Holocaust survivor who spends her, her days tires, tirelessly working on spreading her story of survival and hope to high school students uh, all over the city. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for, for people to see a, a moment in history that is, is both dubious um, and, and, and sad, and to see a story that comes out of it of hope is something we can all take, uh, I, I think, as a positive message. Uh, we're going to let Ms. Broad introduce herself for a moment, and now I'm going to open the floor up to, to you guys. And the best way we do this, and the, the way it's been best in the past, is just ask her questions. She's a real tough lady, and I, I like to tell the story of people when I called her. I, I pick up the phone, I say, hello, Ms. Broad, this is Mr. Grubman. I know who you are. When do you want me to show up? <laughs> and I love that story because it's just, it's real no-nonsense lace. Let's not waste. Yeah, let's not waste time. Time is too short. So that's what I love about her. So if you have questions, if you have questions about the Holocaust, if you've read the book Night, which everybody should have read, um, you have questions about that. If you have questions about her story, which I've given you now, some of you have gotten it uh, beforehand. Uh, once again, there's a wonderful, she's a wonderful fount of information, and there's a lot of great stuff. And it's all going to be driven from the questions you guys have to ask. So without any further ado, Ms. Braun. Uh, my name is Eva Braun, but when I'm speaking about the Holocaust, I use my maiden name, which is Lux L-U-X, because I, this way I'm giving remembrance to my parents who were killed in the Holocaust and have no graves. So that's the only way to make that existence known. So that's how I go. Uh, I survived the Holocaust, and I like, as Mr. Crawford said, I like to spread that I am a positive person, and there is hope. And I am the one that can show it to you. As long as you breathe, there is hope, and don't ever give up. That's my message. OK, would you like to ask something? Anybody have any questions? <coughs> what country are you from? I'm from Czechoslovakia. Sure which today is divided. It's the Slovak Republic and the Czech Republic. I'm from the Slovak Republic. But there is again history, because in 1938, uh, Hitler and Chamberlain, the prime minister of England, they had a pact because they wanted to have, I don't know if you read the term, peace in our times, and they gave many countries over to Hitler's, and Czechoslovakia was divided and my part was given to Hungary. So I was taken to a concentration camp from Hungary. Uh, yes. Do you still practice the same religion? I am same religion. Yeah. Yes, I'm Jewish. Do you still believe in it? Absolutely, absolutely. There is a book about me, and uh, <laughs> we will show it to you. There's, but it's in German, so, but the title of the book, I was and I am a proud Jew. That's the title of the book. You never, you never um, doubted your, your faith no. uh, during, no, during no, the time? No. Because I tell you why. Whatever happened, they are always asking me, do you believe in God? God had nothing to do with it. It's peoples in humanity against people. We always have the ability to do good and to bad, and people choose to do bad. You know something that it has nothing to do with. Like today, young people, they say, oh, I am bored, let's kick some old people, or let's undo something. It's the same idea. You could do good, at the same time you choose to do bad. And they did enormous bad, because they killed six million Jews, and my family. Yes? How did you survive in the Holocaust? How the grace of God, grace of God, because it's, uh, there was nothing heroic. Yes, yeah, some just so happens I did something heroic, but I saved some other people. Uh, but it was just, just given. Yeah, I had a strong belief, and I didn't give up. That's how I survived, if I can say that. Because there were many people in the Holocaust, in the camps, that they just couldn't do it anymore because it was very dramatic. And I, I said, no, I will survive. I will survive. And I didn't. I didn't know the song at that time. Yeah. And how long did you survive the concentration? 
how long did you survive? Like, how long were you in the trip? I was only in camp, yeah. in camp, like uh, ten and a half months. And what but was your every age? day was more than a year. What was your age when you were in camp? Sixteen and a half. Oh, the whole time. I never gave up. And I tell you something, I have to say and remember these words. When we were in the ramp in Auschwitz, and you know, if you read the book, we were divided, first men to the right, women to the left. And then there was another division, uh, able-bodied women to the right, and uh, they were, they duped us, they said that uh, we, were, we were be reunited at night. So women with children, old people went to the left. I was 16 and a half, as I said, and strong. So I went to the right with my younger sister. But my mother's last words were, promise you take care of your younger sister, who is, thank God, still survived. She is in Brooklyn. So that promise, I kept it very seriously. And that promise made me survive. Because I said, I promise to my mother that I will take care of my sister. And I'm not giving. Promise is a very strong word. And once again, this book is the book about that, correct? Yeah, this book is for children about the promise. And, and that's a picture of you guys, yeah, right? Yeah, this is, this is me, my younger sister that survived. And this is the sister that was killed. Yes. Yes. You mentioned before that you helped uh, two people survive. Can you what did I? No, you, you helped two people survive? Yes, yes, you, okay, so I tell that? you. Um, it was end of December already, and we were really like skeletons, okay? And I know you know that we had the tail appeal. We had to stand in row. It was the roll call every single day. And it was very excruciating standing. It was December, and we had no clothing, no nothing. And there was again on the loudspeaker, get out and stand in line, you will be taken, you will be chosen and taken to Germany to work for the German Reich. But nobody believed because we were lied constantly. So my sister and that girl, that was, be she became my camp sister. And uh, they were hiding under the bridges, under the bed. <laughs> they gave up. They literally gave up. We are not going out. And I said, no, 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 you have to come out. They said, no, we, are, we just don't want to live anymore, and we don't believe that we are going to go to Germany. And uh, I said, no. So I convinced them, came out. We were counted again. And they said, they need 200 able-bodied girls. Nobody was able-bodied anymore. And uh, to work for, we are going to Germany. So I was fortunate to get in the group that was taken to the showers and then obviously going uh, out of the camp. Going, at that time, going to the shower was a good sign because you know shower meant gas chamber and so forth. But my sister and that other girl, they were divided on the other side and there was like a bench and they were there standing. And while I was going to the shower, uh, my mind, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? Uh, how I promised Again, the promise, I promised that I will save my sister. And I came back dripping wet, no clothes, nobody had any clothing, obviously, we had no towels or anything dripping wet. And lo and behold, I saw a hose. And I picked up the hose and I watered them. And there was big screaming and yelling. And the SS women and the SS people came running in with dogs and everything. You see, you have to know that we were standing there, 200 girls. We didn't need anybody to watch us because what can you do? Stark naked with nothing. So I did that. And they saw what happened. And the bench was overturned. And who did it? Who did it? And uh, they didn't denounce me, thank God. And there was another counting. And she came in, my sister and that girl. And they are alive, have large families. You know, they were saying it's in the Torah. Whoever saved the person, it's if you save the whole world. And they got back <coughs> the large families. So that's, 
Now people are asking what made me do it. Desperation, nothing, I don't know. I, I knew I have nothing to lose, and then again the promise. I promise that I will save my sister, and then I think I did that girl too. So I'm just telling you, never give up. And if you have no physical means, your mind has to work. I had no physical means, obviously. My mind was, what can I do? But that was, you see, that was God's will. There was the hose and I could do. What can I tell you? And I succeeded. And when we were going out, you know, I started to laugh hysterically because look what I did. I, I did something against Germany, my little, little nothing, okay? And somebody put their hands on my mouth because they said, you don't know who, who did it. And that, that's the story. And I am brave, obviously. Yes? So when they divide the two lines, this line to go to the Germany, and with the other line to where? Go back to the factory or go to the There was no factory. Go to their debt. They were putting to the gas chamber. It was certain that. But I tell you what was luck, because Germany was losing the war already, okay? And we were needed in a factory that was doing the filament for the rackets. Okay, and that's when we went to Germany, we were working in a factory, okay? And that was the first time that we were working in a room sitting, because we had to do the filament little, little needles like, okay? Which we succeeded, we were told, there were some POWs, and they sent a message to somebody, not to me, to somebody that tried to sabotage. And when they say, do it to the right, do it to the left, or whatever, do opposite what they instructed you. But we were told to begin with that if you are doing wrong work, we will be killed. But again, we had nothing to lose. We were at death door constantly, and we did it. I have to tell you, my sister, she was afraid she did a good job. I didn't. But here I go again. Luck was with me, and here we are. Yeah. What were you making in the factory? Uh, filament for the rackets. That was the precursor at that time. You know, it's not like we see today. <laughs> we didn't know, you know, what we are doing. They didn't tell us. Somebody said what we are doing. Yeah. Yes. Um, it says that you were tattooed on your farm. Is the tattoo still there or did yes. it fade away? Let me, let me, let me see it. Mike, can I go up and see it? Yes. I have to tell you that some people, they removed the tattoo. And they asked me, why would I remove it? You have to show, again, men's inhumanity. Because they brand, it's branded, you know, they brand animals. And this yeah. is like branded. We had no names, we were called by numbers. So that's again, I tell you, you know, it wasn't just physical degradation, but it was mental degradation that they do to us. Ms. Brown, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you, um, because he brought up the, the tattoo, can you tell them the piano story? That's yeah, my yeah, favorite. Okay. Right? Your favorite story. <laughs> well, and, and I wish it didn't happen, but it's okay. a great story. I know, I know. Story. I tell you. Um, we were standing again, standing in line, standing in line, and in July we were tattooed. So we thought that the tattoo is a good sign. It means that we are going to leave the camp. No, it was July and I left the camp in December, end of December, December 26. Anyway, and when I was standing in line, and the woman, that, the German woman that was putting the tattoo on me, she said, I'm putting small numbers. When you will play the piano, nobody will see it. I am a cockeyed optimist, and I said, oh, she's talking piano. It means, eventually, we will leave that place, right? Take a long time till we left. And then my grandson, little kid, and he saw the numbers. And he was, I have to tell you then another. He, he said to me, do you believe that she told that you are going to play the piano? Maybe she was making fun of you. I don't know. But you need that hope. Never give up hope. That's my message. And that kept me going, oh, I'm going to play the piano. By the way, I played the violin, never the piano. 
that's another story. And I have to tell you, my grandson was little, and the first time he asked me, what is this number? But I couldn't tell him what it numbers mean. So I said, I will tell you. And he said, oh, I know what it means. You can go to the swimming club anytime. <laughs> <laughs> he figured it out all by himself. Yes? Um, what, was, what was the feeling like when you found out that what was over and was actually going to leave? Elated. I have to tell you something. There is a book, again, I am in the book. It's the anguish of liberation. Okay. Uh, it was a very, very good feel, a tremendous feel again. Because while we were in the camps, we were dreaming, we were reunited, we are going home. But now we have to face the fact. I knew that my mother and sister are killed. I knew that instantly, because they went to the gas chamber. But I was hoping that my father survived. But then, what are we going to do? We are two young children, two young girls, from a sheltered home, never did anything. We are going to go back. No money, no nothing. What are we going to do? So it was very happy, obviously. But it was fear. fear. Yes. Did you go back when you were in yes. you, were yes. you yes. went back to Hungary? Yes, yes. It was Slovakia what was, that your, what was your town like, your city like? Okay, so I tell you. Uh, we had to wait quite like three months. We were in DP camp, transit camps, and there was a long quota going back. It was, you know, Europe was in shambles, and uh, uh, we had to wait till our numbers came up. And our quota was the highest, so we had to wait a long time till we were back. And I went back because I was hoping that my father survived. Okay. But here I tell you something again, I'm full of stories. Uh, it took a long time till we get, and you know, going on the trains, we had to go, not directly, back. I'm from a city. It's the second largest city in Slovakia. But I couldn't go back, we had to go via Budapest, okay? And everybody was hanging off the trains. So if you see movies, you can see that. And we arrived to Budapest, the big state train station, and I was holding on to my sister, but there was tremendous tumult and everybody was, and I, she disappeared, I didn't see her. And all of a sudden I hear Eva, I was yelling Eva, she was yelling Eva, I was saying Vera, her name is Vera, I am Eva. And this young girl came to us and she says, is your name Lux? I have never seen her, I don't know who she is. And there are thousands of people. And she said, I said, yes, who are you? She says, your uncle married my sister, and he sends us every single day to the train station that maybe we will find you. Here you go again. And then we went to my uncle. He was in Budapest. He gave us to eat and some clothing, and we waited a little bit and went back to Kosice. Have you ever had any near like death experiences? Any like death near experiences? Like you're close to dying or being killed? If I was close to dying, yeah, or being okay, I tell you something. You know, you try to remember and then you try to forget. Yeah. And there are things that you bury deep, deep down in your mind and you you don't remember. So when we came to Budapest. And that was the UGA, the United Jewish Appeal. And we, they asked us, there were posters all over, go to that place and give a testimony of what happened to you. So I went, and I did. And, uh, but I never knew what happened then. Uh, when we retired, we lived part-time in Israel, and I was doing volunteer work in the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. And one day came that they got testimonies from Budapest. And they found my testimony. And what was in the testimony? Uh, I have a copy. Uh, what I said, I was in camp, so forth, so on. And then that I was very sick. And I was in the Revere, in the Krankenhaus, in the like, it was like when you go sick, sick house, whatever you call it. The infirmary. Yeah, infirmary. But people were afraid to go there because every night the Germans came and they selected people from there. We don't need you anymore. Out you go. 
And I said then in the testimony, it's written there, that I was released one day, and the following day they came and took the whole infirmary in the gas chamber. I don't remember that. I don't remember. I could say, yeah, I remember. No, I don't. And I said it then and there, like three months after liberation, but I don't remember. So that, you know something, many times, all of a sudden, I remember something that I haven't spoken in 70 years about it, but something comes in, and I remember them. Something totally insignificant, maybe, but something brings it back. Yes? Um, how long, like, after the war was over and you got back to your home? How long? long? How long did it take uh, for you to, like, get back on track with your entire Back on track? Well, I have to tell you, it took a long time. First of all, <laughs> We were looking for relatives, okay? That was the most important thing. And I cannot stress enough for you the importance of family. Cherish them while you have them. You know, there are good things and bad times, bad times and good times. I have nobody to share it with. So it's very, very important. Okay, so I was, we, we, I had my sister, who was young and not as brave as I am. And I had to take care of her, okay? Uh, we had no money. We had nothing. Uh, we wanted, I wanted to go back to the apartment. We live in a big uh, apartment house. And they didn't let us in. The people that live there, they didn't let us in. Because they were afraid that maybe there is something that we buried there, whatever. No, no, they didn't let us in. But my mother had a German, German, Christian relative, a friend, and she took us in, okay? And uh, we were there by her for a while, till we got some money. Uh, my grandparents had a big house, and uh, it took time, but I had to pray, pass, and prove, you know who I am, and we sold the building, and then we had a little, a little money. But I tell you about that also. Uh, the friend, my that my uh, mother had. She was the wife of a businessman that was my husband's, uh, my husband, my husband's. My father made business with that guy, okay? So he was very, he was a very big prominent business person in the city, Koshitsa, where I live. And he was the first one to take and to interrogate, and he never came back when the Germans came in March 19. Now, they had a son, and uh, they, the son was Jewish, obviously, because, so she said she had uh, the barbital, and she said she cheated on him, and it's not his son. And that's his son. You know something? Everybody has a story. And these are stories that are not in books. You have to listen to somebody. Have you ever met a Jehovah's Witness in the camp? A Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witnesses, yes. We were Jehovah's Witnesses, yes. Are you Jehovah's Witness? Yes, I have to tell you. I am doing volunteer work now in a hospital, and the lady that is my boss, so to speak, she's a Jehovah's Witness. I was doing, yesterday I was doing my volunteer work. I like her very much, and I know quite a bit now about Jehovah's Witnesses. She's a good friend of mine now, yes. Yeah, you see, in camp, everybody had some sign. So the Jews had a yellow star or the yellow sign on the back. The red was the communists. The pink was the homosexuals. I think the Jehovah's Witnesses were green. And there are all kinds of, of signs. Yes, they were in camp, yes. yes. <laughs> Have you met anybody from the concentration camps later on? <laughs> if I met somebody? Yeah, maybe. later on. Were you able to, uh, but, but after the war? Speak. Yeah, sure, and I have to tell you something. Until today, most of our friends have some relations to being Holocaust survivors. I have to tell you, when we came, wherever we went, Israel or, or America or Australia, we were strangers in a strange land. We had to be together. 
Like now Thanksgiving been coming. We didn't know what is Thanksgiving. Okay? This was the first time we experienced it. So we were together. And because we could relate to them. Because other people they had strange customs and we had to retain our customs. Okay, I am very happy to be an American today because I live the longest time in my life. But we needed the support of people that are like us. I think he was asking if you met anybody that you knew in the concentration camp, like later on. Yes, yes, I did. Yes, many times, yes. And I have to tell you something. The first thing after, even today many times, but the first thing after liberation, the first, where were you? Where were you? Which camp? That was your ID. And then, have you seen, we were missing relatives. Have you seen this one, that one, that one? Yes. And you know something? Uh, I met a few years ago somebody uh, in the building that I lived in, uh, we were in Israel, and she invited me for coffee. And I didn't know that she was in that camp. And we were talking, and all of a sudden, bingo, she was in the same camp. There was a time that we did not talk about it constantly. In the beginning, yes. But then we just didn't want it to. But still. It, because she was speaking German and I'm speaking German, and somehow it came out. Yes? How long after did you decide to get married? The camp? Uh, like four or five years. Four or five years? Yeah. I wasn't ready. My husband was ready, I wasn't ready. <laughs> <laughs> yes? When the war ended and you worked in a German factory, I was not working in a German factory when the war ended. Sorry, okay. It was before. Well, when you got rescued when the war ended, what organization uh, helped to bring you back home? Uh, well, there were different organizations. It depended which country you came from, you know. But uh, UGA was the one that uh, helped us most most everybody. They, we, we needed papers, we had nothing, no birth certificate, no nothing, right? So they took, they took us, they believed us what we said. But when I came back to the city that I come from, I had my birth certificate, I could get it. I had my father's birth certificate. I, I, I was working on it because to sell the house, the building, I had to prove who I am. But many people had nothing, they just did. They, you had to bring two witnesses, and said they knew you. I have to tell you, many people changed their date of birth. They wanted to be younger or whatever. Right? Yeah. My birth certificate. And UJA, what does that stand for? Yes, they've had that. But I, I have to tell you, they might have another name then at that time. Okay, but that was the organization. That was the organization. United Jewish Appeal. <coughs> yes, yes, something like that, yes. I want to know what kind of food you have daily in this concentration camp that they give it to you. The reason I'm asking this question is that I want the students over here to know how lucky they are yes. when they have lunch over here. You can say that again. You can say that again. You can say that again. And I tell you something and then I go back. Uh, how lucky you are to have because you don't know what is starving. And you know, you all come home and say, I'm starving. My son comes home, came home when he was a little kid, you know, from school, and he opens the fridge and there is nothing to eat, right? You have said that. And the fridge there is full. I'm starving, there's nothing to eat. I said, don't ever say that you are starving. You don't know what starving is. I know what starving is. And I have to tell you, until today, I don't like to throw out food. Food is something very precious to me. And, and when I go to my children and they have leftover food, I bring it home because they are going to throw it out. And I, thank God, I can afford to good food, I tell you. But I cannot see that they are wasting food. Okay, so what we had in camps. So we had three times we got food. So in the morning, we got some brown liquid that they called coffee, but obviously it was not coffee, it was brown. And then we had a bread like this, but it was not bread, it was like sawdust or whatever. And we had to divide it in three. 
And on the weekend, we had a little pet of margarine and jam. And that bread had to last us the whole day, okay? That third of, of bread. And many people, they ate it right then and there, because I have to tell you, and you cannot, today you cannot say why they did it, you cannot blame anybody, but many times if you save the bread, it was stolen. I mean, it, you, you know, it was different morals. It's different. Then for lunch, we went to work, right? So I don't know what time they bring a big kettle of soup, but again, it was not soup. It was some liquid, and maybe a little bit cabbage was swimming in it or, or whatever. And if the auxiliary, the SS woman, was in a vile mood, she just kicked the bucket, and she said, now lick it. And they licked it. And then she called us. They called us every name you can imagine. They called us swine and whatever, you know, because we were starving, okay. And at night, the same, we had the leftover bread and whatever. The only time when we got a little better food, you know, what is Yom Kippur? It's a fast day, it's a Jewish fast day. It's like September, October. And the Germans knew, so they gave us better food because we were the one of us that were religious and I was observant, we were fasting that day. So they wanted us to break the fast and eat, so they gave us a little better. And some of us, we said, we are here as Jews and we want to be die as Jews. I have to tell you, as I said, they thought of every possible way to punish us, belittle us. Names that you cannot even imagine. They told, obviously, they kicked us, they pulled the hair after the, you know, we were shaven first. But then when they had me back, I have a dog bite because they sick the dog on me, not on me, on everybody, you know, when they didn't lie. They beat us, what can I tell you, every punishment. And you know, today we are saying if it's cold outside, oh, I'm freezing. And I survived the winter, I saved myself today. I, I survived in a dress, no underwear, no nothing. Okay. So, yes. What was the youngest person you remember and how old? Youngest? I have to tell you, they were some young people, young girls. We just were maybe 12, 11, but I tell you what they did. They were the Lauferins. They were nice looking little girls. And they were Lauf means that runners. They were the runners. And they had to bring some notices to the camp supervisor or whatever, yes. And then the twins, that they did their experiments, they were also young. Okay, not, some of them survived, some of them not. Were you able to actually see some of those procedures, those uh, experiments? But did you I actually did witness that? I did the experiment on me, but they were pregnant women and, uh, you know, but in the beginning, they asked who is pregnant, so nobody said that they are pregnant. But later on, they went and they opened their stomach without anesthesia, obviously. They wanted to see how, how much pain you can suffer. Or they put you, I, I never went to that, I have to say that. But they put them in freezing water, in and out. How much can you suffer? They were always, and I have to tell you, they were physicians that did this experiment of the benefit of humanity to find out how much can you tolerate. But um, Ms. Ron, you referenced, uh, I know the twins, yes. uh, Joseph Mangala, one of the things that, that, that he's almost notorious for yes. is his, his twin experiments. Yes, he would try to uh, discolor their eyes to make yeah, them all blue. Yeah, yeah. He